be seated. Thanks for uh, helping us get through that. Uh, <coughs> talking again. <and coughs> Pastor Mark, come up with for us. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mark. I think we need just a little more help on that. Or more on that. Uh, our call to worship comes from Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. 
Good. Any more? Yep. Here they come. How strong are you? Are you really strong? Looks like somebody's fought a serpent here. That's pretty cool. You know, um, there's another one. Yay. If you're strong, can you break a bubble? Can you break it? Uh, yeah. Easy, right? Very easy. volunteer. Good. Okay. If you're strong, can you break a noodle? All right. Yeah. You're strong. You're strong. Okay. Another volunteer. Who's okay. Your turn. Oh, man. Yeah. You, if you're strong, can you break that rock? Probably not. That's a metamorphic rock, and it's you, very, very. It was he, by the heat of the earth, and created as a piece of quartz, and so it's awesome. Well, there is a Bible character by the name of Samson. He's very, very strong. He had a secret why he was strong, and the people that didn't love God. Now Samson loved God. And was part of God's people. And the people that the Philistines didn't love God, but they wanted to know why Samson was so strong, and so they'd trick him. And one night they kept him in the city. And during late in the night, Samson broke open the city gates and carried him up to a big hill, which was really a heavy job. Big wood gates to a city. And so uh, Samson could not be tricked. And he would he would, um, he, in fact, finally his wife said, if you love me, you'll tell me why you're so strong. And he said, he had to, kind of got in a bad place there, so he said, well, if my hair is cut, I will not be strong any longer. So in the night, Delilah had, um, had a Philistine come and um, cut his hair. And then Samson lost his strength. And they took him to prison. The Philistines put him in prison. And this is my old Bible story book. Okay, look at this. What happened? They took him to a party to make fun of Samson and chained him to some wood pillars like that rock. And guess what? Samson pulled the palace down. He was, because he had, he asked God for extra strength. Even though his hair was cut, he asked God for strength, which God gave Samson in the Bible. In Ephesians 6.10, it says, Be strong by the power and might of God. It's one of seven God's seven spirits, knowledge and fear, wisdom and understanding, power and might. So if you're strong in your life, you depend on God. And today, you know how you can be strong all your life by depending on God and asking him for help. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, our strength comes from you, from the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you for your spirit and all the power of knowledge and fear, wisdom and understanding, power and might. They are ours by asking in Jesus' name. Amen.
have any praises today? Anyone have any praise to share this morning? The rain stopped when the wind quit blowing, right? That's a good one. All right. Any others? Well, we have a very dear friend with her. Her name's Stephanie. She's from Dassel, Minnesota. And she's on her way home after being in Clarion for a few days. But she's kind of became like a daughter to me when I ministered in Clarion. And, and we've kept touch over the years. And it's just been good to reconnect after all this time. So she stopped and we spent some time together uh, when she came down. And now she thought she'd come and hear me preach on the way home. So uh, it's good to see Steph in church today. A very special person in my heart that I love dearly. Um, our prayer request, we certainly want to remember Nathan McVeigh and, and Wanda's sister Wilma and people who are homebound. Uh, any other that we might mention? Many of you might know Grant Woodley. Uh, Grant is was one of my kids in the church in Clarion for 19 years. He was in my son Adam's class and uh, very close to Grant and his family, uh, Gary and Sally. And, uh, but Grant has had all sorts of medical problems and, and uh, some brain injury that uh, looked kind of like an infection in his brain. He, asked, uh, he pastors the Lutheran Church in Clarion. Uh, I talked to Grant yesterday over in Clarion at the Festival of the Park and he can preach once a month. He has enough strength to do that. Uh, he can't, he has to read his sermons where he used to just not read his sermons. Uh, he can't do the whole service. He just really is struggling. On top of that, his wife Nicole has a uh, very uh, aggressive form of cancer. And she goes to Texas like every three months or something for, for that. And, and, uh, and she also is a pastor as well. And then they have some children that they adopted that have some very serious issues. And they're, ha I mean, I just, you know, just my heart went out to Grant. So I, I just like for us to keep Grant and Nicole uh, and their family in our prayers. It's a very difficult uh, thing for them to go through. And, uh, but they have good neighbors that help with the farming and that kind of stuff. Okay. So as we go to our prayer, let's stand and let's sing hymn number 56.
You may be seated. <laughs> Loving and gracious God, we're thankful that Jesus' last words before he left this world is that he would be with us always. And day to day and moment by moment, he walks with us. And as the song says, I pray that we will have the faith as to take from our Father's hand a God who loves us and who wants to help us in our deepest needs, who wants to walk with us in the good times and walk with us in the times in which we struggle. So we trust you. We trust your Holy Spirit in us to bring the comfort that you promised that he would bring. We trust that we know that whatever we face on a day-to-day -day basis, as Betty talked with the kids, you give us the strength not in and of ourselves, but our strength to endure through our faith in you. And Lord, we mention these today that we are concerned about in our prayer time, and, and we know that you hold them dear to your heart, and you are that Father that just wants to, to bless them in so many ways. And we certainly pray for healing where healing is possible. We pray for patience when people need to wait to go through that healing process for them, and, and we pray that we as your people might find ways that we might minister not only to those we've mentioned today, but other people in our community that are in need. Lord, we continue to pray for our search committee as we continue to look for leadership of our congregation. We just pray that as we look to call someone to serve Emmanuel, we just pray that, that the right person might just be there waiting for to answer that call and, and to come and share this uh, work with this congregation that we all love so much and that we're also invested in. But most of all, Lord, we're thankful that you are God and in the chaos of our world, as we look at the world events, as we look at events in our own nation, that you, as a song goes, continues to hold the world in your hands. And that someday the heavens will depart and your son will come to redeem us all and this will be the end and that we'll spend eternity with you, knowing that you are a loving and kind and gracious God who loves us dearly. We thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Let's look at our scripture. You should know this by now. We're halfway through, Okay. The sermon. So I can get them all done today if you want to stay till like two. <laughs> we'll continue to spread them out. Now let's say this together. We should know it quite well since we've been, last four weeks, this is the fifth week that we've been looking at God's fruit of the Spirit with these nine flavors. Let's say it together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. I want to look at the other scripture that we're going to look at today. It's from Luke chapter 10. It's a very familiar passage. You know this story. You learned it when you were little kids. But this guy comes to Jesus and he wants to know what he has to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus says to love your Lord, your God. That's the Old Testament with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then he goes on and says, you love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the guy, he wants to know who his neighbor is, all right? So Jesus tells this story to explain his neighbor. In verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho, where he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite... When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. And then he put, on, then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he... He took out two silver coins and gave it to the innkeeper and said, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you might have. Okay. So, we looked at love, we looked at joy, 
We've looked at peace, and last week Lee did a great job in talking about patience, right? Amen? Amen. <laughs> we'll get it out of you one way or another, folks, all right? <laughs> all right. All right, so today, let's look and see how we're doing. Kindness. So here's your test for the day. How many of you, and don't lie, okay? How many of you would say that you were a kind person? Ah, oh, come on. Everybody thinks they're kind. Come on. Listen, you're in church, right? You are in church, folks, all right? It's not against the law to raise your hand. And let's admit that we all think that we're kind people. Uh, actually, you know, they call it Iowa nice, don't they? It's Iowa nice. So when we read our text, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Man, that's a breeze. We just think we got that one nailed. Uh, we got it down. We really don't need this sermon today because we're all good, kind Iowans. We can just skip it. We can get out of church early, but that ain't going to happen, right? But we kind of think, well, we've earned the kindness merit badge because we were taught since we were little kids to be kind. Be kind to your sisters. Be kind to your brother. Be kind to this person. Be kind to that person. So we've earned this badge of kindness. And we were proudly, I think. Most of us do. But do you? Are you really, truly kind as God would want us to be kind in this world. It's so easy, it seems like, but the Bible, if it's so easy, why is it listed here? And why does the Bible say an awful lot about kindness and being kind? If it's an easy thing to do, the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. The kind of kindness that is generated in our hearts by God's Holy Spirit who lives within us and dwells within us, in us 24 hours, seven days a week, all of the time we have God's kindness in us and we are called to be kind. But when God talks about kindness, he raises the level of what we normally think of as kindness. And actually, the Bible often refers to it as loving kindness. Not just kindness, but loving kindness. Here's a verse. Let's look at this one. This one might surprise you. Jeremiah 31.3. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with everlasting love and have drawn you with loving kindness. And who is it that God is drawing to him with loving kindness? The righteous. No, God's loving kindness is giving to those who have rebelled against the Lord and have turned away from him. God is kind to what? The wicked. <laughs> right? Wow. And not only is that in the Old Testament, Jesus says in Luke 6, 35, love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without getting anything back, because God is kind to the ungrateful in the wicked. <laughs> really? Are you? Are you kind to the ungrateful, the wicked? You see, loving kindness does not dis, 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 <laughs> discriminate, they discriminate between good and bad people. God doesn't treat his enemies any different than he treats his followers and his friends. God is kind to the ungrateful. How about that? Are you? You see, sometimes we'll be kind to a person and we'll be kind to them maybe four or five times, but if they aren't ungrateful, we'll just say, I ain't going to help them anymore. <laughs> they don't deserve my kindness. I've tried hard. And we give up on them. Hmm. God is kind to the ungrateful. Wow. 
And it's easy to show kindness to people, but to really look at people who are ungrateful and say, I can be kind to you over and over again. And why is God kind to all people? There's a reason for that in the Bible. The Bible says in, in Romans 2, 4, we read, God's kindness leads to repentance. Now, I, here's how I think that it applies to us, okay? When we are unkind to ungrateful people or people that we might be considered wicked, it leads to change lives. Because they can't figure out why in the world or how in the world we would even show them any kindness. Because they know they're not good people and they know that they're not grateful. And why would we over and over and over again continue to show kindness to these people who do not deserve it, by the way? They're undeserving of our kindness. But what is our motivation? Our motivation is to change their lives into a relationship with Jesus our Lord. And our world looks at kindness and says, no, no, don't do that. You set a boundary, and once you've helped that person a couple times, you can write it off. It's kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card. You don't have to worry about it anymore because you did your part. And this doesn't say you show kindness to somebody, and if they don't do their part, you just can walk away. God doesn't say that to us. Not at all. So we have to realize that. And then I've got to get to my right page. <laughs> Ephesians 2.7 in the Message Bible. I like this verse. It says, we who believe show others the riches of God's incredible kindness. That's our job. And listen to this part. God offers kindness to those who don't deserve it. And us, regardless of how the recipients of his kindness respond. Do we? As God's followers? The fruit of the spirit that is in you is not the kindness the world might see, but it is God's loving kindness. It is a deep kindness. It's not that I'm kind to a person, but as a believer, I show loving kindness to everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, even when they don't deserve kindness from me to them. I strive to be kind, even when they're ungrateful. So let's go back to our text and ask the question, are we a kind person? And we're going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan we know that story well. And the guy says, who's my neighbor? Who is it that I'm responsible to, to be kind to? And as we look at these different characters in the story, try not to judge them. Because it's easy to judge the robbers. It's easy to judge the, the priest and the Levite. But let's not do that. Let's kind of look at that. First, we see those who are selfish and hostile. Oh, those are the robbers. Robbers are always selfish, aren't they? They're out for themselves. They want to get what they can get, and they want to get it easily. So they steal from people. They actually beat this dude up and leave him. They take his clothes from him, of all things. And they leave him laying alongside the road, half dead, because they just want something for themselves. Now, I don't know if any of us are robbers. I hope not. I doubt it, you know, if you're a kind person. But isn't it easy to be so selfish and to, to get what we want in our lives? The book of James says that the reason that we have battles and quarrels within is because we want our own way. That's true. I want my own way. Don't you? I do. I like having my own way. And it's easy to be kind to someone on my own terms, when I can do it in my own way. So I kind of bottle up kindness and I kind of pick and choose because I can do it my own way <clears throat> and still be selfish because I'm just kind of hoarding this and it's like those special occasions when I can do that. But it's, it's kind of selfish at times. And sometimes it's selfish in the way that I think, you know, if I'm kind to this person, oh, they're going to go, oh, that Pastor Mark, he's such a kind person. Yeah. And they tell someone, oh, we love Pastor Mark, you're so kind to me. Yeah. Right? 
We kind of do it for our own stroke. Kind of like, oh man, this makes me feel good. It does too. I know when I am kind to people, it makes me feel pretty good. So we see those who are selfish. We can be that way. And then the next two guys are, are the, 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 the Levi and the priest, you know, and they come by separate times, but they're just indifferent. You know, Jesus doesn't tell us why they both passed by on the other side, but I have some ideas as to why they did it. They just walked around this dude, saw him laying there on the road. And these are the religious leaders. You know, they're the ones who are supposed to take care of people. They're the ones who are the ministerial association, who their job is to care for people. The Old Testament, over and over and over again, tells them, you care for people. Even the foreigners in your land, you take care of people. And you expect them, of all people, to offer some kind of help. And they just pass by and just cross over on the other side. As I went through this this week, it made me wonder how many times do I just pass by people who make me feel uncomfortable. Don't make eye contact with them. People who really, truly need a helping hand. And how often do we, as individuals, and I know it's so easy to do, even when I was a pastor, to have someone come in need and just to pass them off to the ministerial association instead of dealing with them ourselves. Easy thing to do. And it's something that I did often when I would have someone knock on my door. It's just easier to pass them off, say, hey, go over to this church, they can help you. They have our funds, they have, they have the food pantry, they have those kinds of things. So easy to do. And sometimes, you know, we think about these guys that walk by and I think one reason why they didn't even check the guy out was as leaders in the temple, had they went over and touched the guy, they would be declared unclean. And they wouldn't have been able to do their priestly duties until they went through that time of waiting when they could be declared clean. And it makes me one time wondering, you know, sometimes we don't help somebody because we just think that someone might wonder why we're helping that person. Some of might go, they're not worthy of it. I can think of several people in my ministry that I became friends with and I was questioned about it. You know, some of them were kind of on the edge. I like people on the edge sometimes. I remember helping someone who was in prison. He was in prison for child, child abuse. One of the horrible things of just as horrible. But as many people gave up on him, and I had a hard time with that. And it was really hard for me to go visit him in prison and to continue to do that. He's out now, and he's still someone I talk to from time to time. I think about that. I think about one of the most ridiculous ones was when I was in Lewis, Iowa, a little tiny town. That was like my second church after Mason City. And uh, I had a friend who was a United Methodist. And I had, I had an elder call me out at, uh, at a meeting, a board meeting, about wasting my time on the United Methodist. That's true, honestly. You know? And then it's like, I still, he still was my friend, you know? But it's so silly how legalism sometimes, and those things can just kind of keep us boxed in and and we're afraid of helping people because we're, th we're afraid that somebody might, might think of us wrongly if we come alongside somebody that might kind of be a social outcast. But you know what? Praise God for this guy. This good Samaritan who shows loving kindness. And when Jesus mentioned that this guy was a Samaritan, because we figure all these other guys are Jewish, but when Jesus mentioned that this guy is a Samaritan, the people had to gasp. <gasps> because they hated the Samaritans. If they were going to go through, through the area and travel and the shortcut was through Samaria, they would go the long ways because it would be like us driving in the big city. And we didn't want to go through the bad parts of town. And they didn't want to go through Samaria because that's where the Samaritans were. So 
here is a guy totally out of character. He wasn't the same as the guy laying on the road. But I love him. And here's some take-home points just from this dude that knew what loving kindness was. Number one, loving kindness takes action. He did something. He helped a man in need because kindness is always love in action. In fact, loving kindness has to be expressed. It's consistent. It's not something that comes and goes. The love chapter, isn't it? Love is kind. And we read that at our weddings. And sometimes kindness is simple. It's an easy thing to do. I read a story about an elderly lady who liked going to the post office because the, the people behind the counter were so friendly to her. And one time, you know, she was standing in this long line waiting to buy stamps, and the guy behind her knew what she was there for. And he said, you know, lady, you can go back. There's a stamp machine back here. And you go back and be out of here in seconds. Just go back and you know, buy your stamps at the stamp machine. And the lady said, well, I, I know that. But the machine won't smile at me or ask me how my arthritis is, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it's simple, but sometimes it's even more difficult. And Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, close yourself with kindness. Now, when we got up this morning, we thought about what we were going to clothe ourselves with, right? We certainly didn't want to come here naked. You know, we had to clothe ourselves. And he says, clothe yourself with kindness. Wear it every single day day. And the second thing is loving kindness takes risk. If I had been a Samaritan and I'm walking along and I see this guy alongside the road, I would have been concerned that these robbers were still in the area. That they were hanging out because I'm sure they'd robbed other people and that they might rob me too. Looking for the next victim. And yet he was willing to risk his own life and his own possessions he knew they were in jeopardy. And then I thought on this as I walked through this, what if Jesus would have taken the safe route and not taken any chances? The old hymn goes, In loving kindness Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. From deaths of sin and shame he, in grace he lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me. With tender hand he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh, praise his name, he lifted me. And Jesus was willing to rescue everything. He left heaven to come to this world and he risked it to be kind to you, that you might change your life and follow him. And he did it for you. Third, loving kindness pays the price. You know, wine was expensive. It wasn't box wine, I don't think. <laughs> wine was expensive, and oil was expensive, and yet he takes this guy, and he bandages him, he pours oil and wine on his wounds, and then he takes him to an inn, probably out of his way, and he paid the price. And there was a chance when he did that, that this man would come to, his, come to himself and not be grateful at all for what the Samaritan had done. There was that chance. Loving kindness, showing it to other people, does not give us any guarantees at all. Luke 12, 33 says, be generous. Give to the poor. Give yourselves a bank that cannot go bankrupt, a bank in heaven far from the bank robbers, safe from the embezzlers, a bank you can bank on. That's the message Bible. And fourth, loving kindness puts others first. I'm sure the Samaritan had an agenda. He had a schedule for the day, and yet it sidetracked him. He didn't think about himself, but he put the needs of this wounded man above himself. And he gave himself. And putting others first means we are called to give our most precious commodities, our time, our talents, our treasures. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition, but consider others in humility above yourselves. And finally, kindness finishes what it starts. One of the things that I love the most about this story is that Samaritan not only paid for the man, spent the night with the man, took care of him, 
But when he left, he says to the innkeeper, hey, I'll come back, and if there's any more expenses for this dude, I'll pay for it. He didn't know the guy. But he promised to come back and pay for whatever needed. He finished what he started. And sometimes when we show kindness, we don't check up and go back and finish the job because we think we've done our job too. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Not as easy as you think it is, is it? And it's the kindness I believe that the community around Belmont needs to see in us as we live out our lives. And it only comes from the Holy Spirit who lives in us. It's not natural. And as we talked about with the other parts of the fruit of the Spirit, we have to water it. And we have to nurture it. And we have to allow it to grow in our lives. And as we do that, we might, we just might change a life or two. We just might turn someone's life around because they knew that someone cared enough to hang in there. The Bible says, Jesus told his disciples, you know, the night he was betrayed, that he loved them to the end. You ever think about that? You know, they were going to run. Peter is going to betray him. Thomas is going to doubt him. He says, you know what, guys? I'm going to love you to the end. And I think when we meet people in our lives and God puts in our paths and we want to be Jesus to them, our commitment needs to be the same as Jesus, that we're going to love them to the end. We don't give up on folks. We don't. And the world is so easy, so, so easy to give up on people. Kindness. Well, how are we doing? How about the test again? Oh, we are going to do that, all right? Okay. So our hymn today is More Love to Thee, responsive hymn. I think one way that I can show more love to Jesus is to show more love to others. That's how we do it. If you're able to stand, let's stand and see more love to Thee. need some people to help make the offering this morning. <laughs> What's that? Okay, Lawrence, he's coming. No, he's still up there. I think he fell asleep during the sermon. He doesn't even know he's up there. <laughs> Don, you can do, okay? Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, 
Thank you for your loving kindness to us. We can't repay that, Lord. Try as much as we can. We can never repay the debt that you paid for us. But Lord, we can give. And everyone sitting in pews here at this church, we truly believe in the mission of this church. Our mission to re reach out to this community. Our mission to show loving kindness to people who maybe haven't been shown kindness. A mission that you might call people to repentance and will see changed lives. People whose lives become better because they have met us, someone in our church who truly cared for them and that way they met your son. So we know your blessing will be upon this offering. We give it with glad hearts. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.
thanks again for uh, the interesting sermon on kindness, the challenge that we face in many ways that I think we forget that we can show kindness to people and, and that uh, it's more than just uh, doing something once and hoping if they don't, aren't grateful that we forget about them. So another challenge. Why do you keep doing that? Uh, Really, I don't have anything to say. We have, we're working uh, on the possibility with a new pastor. Uh, we have some hopes anyway. It's, uh, we're just at the first stages. So I would strongly encourage everyone to pray for the search team and also for the gentleman that, uh, that we are uh, working with. And uh, if hopefully... This will be God's prayer. Answer to our prayer. That's it. What a day. On Paul's birthday. Yeah. He's old, Larry says. So, happy birthday. Long happy birthday. Do we want to sing happy birthday here or out there? Do it out there. All right, because you guys want to go home. I know. So, actually, and now following our little time of fellowship. If anyone wants to stay and discuss about being kind, we'll do that afterwards as we discuss this sermon. My benediction is just that scripture from our text. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, close yourself with kindness. Amen? Amen. 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 When we all get to heaven. Okay, hold it up. We will take this. Yeah, since he already said it, I thought that would be better to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and remember the second time we're singing, it's God bless you.